and it's time to listen to speaking the truth to power. This gentleman who is going to address us today has made his name, carved his own niche in the area of speaking truth to power. Your Excellency is very distinguished, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to bring to the podium Professor Patrick Lumumba. Professor P.L.O. Lumumba is a professor of public health, a holder of an LLD Doctor of Laws on the Law of the Sea from the University of Kent, Belgium, Master's of Law degree, and a host, a host, I must say, uh, lots of um, honorary degrees of Doctors of Law, D, oh my God, Honoris Causa from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana is a holder of the degree of Doctor of Science, Human Rights at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, University of London in England, Humanitarian Law at the Raoul Wellenberg Institute of the University of London, Sweden, and on International Human uh, Humanitarian Law in Geneva, Switzerland. He's an advocate of the High Courts of Kenya and Tanganyika, and a certified mediator. He is a fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya, FCPS, a fellow of the Kenya Institute of Management, and an honorary fellow of the African Academy of Science. He is the chairman of Farafina Investment Group in Monrovia, Liberia, an economic strategic growth and development initiative for Africa based in Nigeria. He is the immediate former director and chief executive officer of the Kenyan School of Law, a former secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission and a former director of the defunct Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission. He is the founding trustee of the African Institute for Leaders and Leadership, and was the founding dean of Kabarak University School of Law, a former lecturer at the University of Nairobi, the United States International University, and wider University US in Nairobi. I can go on and on and read about this proud son of Africa, whom I'm honored to introduce to us. I bring to the microphone our brother, Professor, PLO Lumumba. Asante. We welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me start by recognizing the chief guest, who is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Permit me also to recognize the family of the late Dr. Abubakar Olusola Saraki. And permit me for good order to stand on the protocols already established. Let me say how glad, honored, and privileged I am to be invited to deliver a memorial lecture on the 10th anniversary to commemorate the departure of Dr. Abubakar Olushala Saraki. Any keen student of African politics, and I claim to be such a keen student, would have heard of Dr. Saraki and I had heard of him before this invitation. I had also had the honor and privilege of meeting Dr. Bukola Saraki when he was the president of the Senate. And he granted me the opportunity to address the Senate then. That is not to forget that my good friend Brother Bajamila also granted me a similar occasion in the House of Representatives. I'm glad to deliver a lecture to memorialize an individual of whom it can be said that 
that he was a colossus who bestrode the Nigerian political terrain and made his contribution in a manner that makes it worthy to be remembered favorably. I say so because there is no shortage of individuals who come and go and their memories are not worth much. We have had the honor and privilege of seeing the snippets of what he did during his lifetime. And if it is true that one is not successful until his successor succeeds, then Dr. Saraki was successful. He was successful because his successors have succeeded and they continue to succeed. If it is true that men and women did are recognized for their positive contribution to society, then it is true that Dr. Saraki was a man worthy of celebration. I'm glad to be in your distinguished presence to deliver a lecture in his memory and to have that lecture focus on the critical question of leadership in Africa and the critical question of followership in Africa. And the Africa that I talk about is the post-colonial Africa. The Africa which is now divided into 55 countries with 55 boundaries imposed on her. An Africa which is famous as the cradle of mankind. An Africa which is said to be great in prospect. An Africa about which there is much expectation, but an Africa which continues to punch below her weight. That is the Africa that I will be talking about as I focus on the question of leadership and followership. As I think about that Africa and her leadership and followership, and I think about her often as all of us should, the words of a book that I read as a youngster come to mind. And any one of us who had the opportunity of reading the book A Tale of Two Cities will remember these words. It was the time, the best of times, and the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light and the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and the winter of despair. Those words define the mother continent as we live in her today. Those who commentate about the continent never tire to say that this is a great continent. Those who care about this continent never tire to remember that this continent divided as she is has had many leaders. And when I allow my mind to go down memory lane, I can remember so very vividly the immortal words of many great African leaders on the eve of our regaining our independence. 
And many of us can see pictures of young Africans, whether in Nigeria or Ghana or Algeria or Kenya or Tanzania, celebrating when we regained our independence. And many of us can remember the words that they spoke and the promises that they made. If it was in Nigeria here, you can remember the immortal words about what they would do to Nigeria of Namdi Azikiwe. You can remember those words. You can remember the words of Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa. You can remember the promises he made. You can remember the erudite words of the Saudana of Sokoto, Ahmadu Bello, and the promises he made, and many others. When they spoke then, those who are young saw in them the similitude of Moses in the Bible. They thought of their leaders and saw their leaders as messiahs who would bedazzle latter-day pharaohs with miracles, who would liberate them from the Egypt of poverty and want, who would cause pillars of fire to stand between them and sorrow and want, who would part the Red Seas of tribalism and ethnicity, who in times of hunger would summon manner and quail from heaven. That is what they thought of their leaders, messiahs. But today, permit me to say, in many African countries they are saying, it was better while we waited. It was better while we waited. There is a sense in which throughout the continent of Africa, there has been disappointment with leaders at all levels. So that when on the eve of independence, we wanted to come home, now that we regained independence, we never tire to see images of our young men and women dying in the Sahara, dying in the Mediterranean Sea, being humiliated at the embassies of the erstwhile colonizers as they seek to leave our countries and the continent. It was better while we waited, they say. Which begs the question, what happened and what is happening? That we have so many individuals who occupy positions of leadership. And yet the biggest deficit is that of leadership in Africa. You know, in 1983, your own countryman, the late Chinua Achebe, wrote a little book which he could well have been writing about Africa, but he focused on Nigeria, the trouble with Nigeria. And Chinua, without mincing words, says, the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. Whether you agree or disagree with Chinua, that is another debate. But he had his perspective. And he was asking a question that we continue to ask about the continent of Africa. Why is it that while on average, 60 years after we regained independence, the 55 countries that constitute the continent of Africa, why is it 
that we cannot feed ourselves? Why is it that we have no faith in our institutions, we have no faith in our hostels? Why is it that we have no faith in our abilities? Why is it? Where has the leadership been? Why is it that so many years, while politics becomes the toy that lulls us into a false sense of security, our economies are controlled by people from other civilizations? Why is it? These are uncomfortable questions which we must pose and confront and answer if the mother continent is to realize our potential. Why is it that the mother continent is ever so negatively attractive to other civilizations? You know, as I talk about leadership, and as I think about leadership, and I think about lead, what leaders are enjoined to do, I think about this mother continent. And many times, I see how our men and women in positions of leadership are being treated by other civilizations. And I said, oh God, where are our leaders? When the world congregates under the G7, there are no African leaders there. The best they can do is to invite one or two. And beyond the photo opportunity, they are told to go away and go away, they do. When there is a meeting of the G20, it is the same thing. There is no African leader there. And when at the United Nations, they have voted all our countries, France, the United States, China, Russia, can come and neutralize all our votes. And I say, where are the leaders in Africa? And as you observe African leadership today, they are summoned by different leaders in the world. If the Japanese do not summon them to Tokyo under Anktad, the Indians are summoning them to New Delhi. And if the Indians are not summoning them, the Turks are summoning them. And if the Turks are not summoning them, the Chinese are summoning them. In the next two year, two weeks, they will have been summoned to the United States of America. Summoned, I use. Africans who are watching this scenario ask, where are our leaders? Which begs the question, who is a leader? Is leadership the occupation of office? Is leadership the occupation of the office of the president? Is it the occupation of the office of a senator or a member of parliament? or the occupation of these high sounding positions which gives us honorifics is that what leadership is from where i sit that is pseudo leadership from where i sit leadership is about service leadership is about honor and privilege to serve that is why I still understand the men of old, the men of wisdom who said, he who is the greatest amongst you must be your servant. This is what Africa is asking for. And Africa has been asking this question since she regained her independence. You know, when one is talking about leadership in Africa, one must go into history and ask ourselves what was leadership before we were rudely dis disrupted we had our traditional rulers how did they govern for whose benefit did they govern they are still there the traditional rulers 
How do they fit in in the new dispensation? When we regained independence and adopted all these structures from the erstwhile colonizer, what did we expect to deliver? That great American Pan-Africanist John Hendrix Clark says that when Africans regained their independence, not a single one of them re-examined the style of leadership. All of them continued with a mimicry of the leadership that they inherited from the colonizer. And he then delivered this verdict. Not a single African country will ever succeed by mimicry. And I want to submit to you that whether one agrees or disagrees with John Henry Clark, one must look at Africa in order to ask ourselves what is the state of leadership in Africa? And permit me to run you across the continent of Africa and you will see a continent that is not at ease. The continent is not at ease because the continent is suffering from a deficit of leadership. Look at Africa today. Tell me whether we are at ease in Niger. Tell me whether Mali is settled. Tell me whether there is quiet and calm in Chad. Tell me whether Guinea-Bissau is doing well. Tell me whether the Cameroons are stable. Tell me whether Central African Republic is good. Tell me whether Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Northern Mozambique, so and all these countries where there is peace and quiet. Whether the sons and daughters of this country, tell me whether even this great Nigeria is at ease. Tell me. The answer is she is not. And I dare say that as long as Nigeria is not at ease, Africa will never be at ease. If Africa wants to be at ease, Africa, Nigeria must be at ease. She is the largest economy in Africa. She has a population of over nearly 200 million people. One in every African is a Nigerian. She is represented in every sector. If you want the best engineers in the continent, they are Nigerians. If you want the best doctors, they are Nigerians. If you want good lawyers, they are Nigerians. If you want good people, they are Nigerians. But also, if you want Yahoo boys, they are Nigerians. Nigeria is a great country. A friend of mine once told me that if you go to any part of the world and you do not find a Nigeria, leave that place because there is nothing to do there. Nigerians are present everywhere in the world, everywhere in Africa, and Nigeria, I'm told, is a $500 billion economy. Never, ever be proud of that, Nigerians. This is an economy that should at least be a $4 trillion GDP economy. Whenever you reach that level, then I'll say Nigeria is doing the right thing. All the ingredients are there. The question is, why is it that she is not realizing our potential? When we talk about leadership, we must ask ourselves, why is it? that despite the best intention of the best of us, we do not gain and gain what we desire. You know, I said that when you look at Africa and leadership, you must go back to history. And you ask yourself what the leadership is. And we have looked at Africa that is not at ease. But yet there is a sense in which Africa has had and continues to have men and women of renown. I remember courtesy of history. 
when Africa was struggling for our independence, I can remember that great meeting in Manchester in the United States of America, the Pan-African meeting. And history tells me that Nigeria was there, she for Bafemi Awolowo was there in 1945. And I can still remember his words spoken about African unity. I remember that Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah was there. And then we remember how they came back to the continent to lead the continent. And I am still wondering how in those days, without the benefit of the internet, without the benefit of all means of communication that we now have today, that those men and women were able to govern and to galvanize the attention of the continent of Africa for the sake of Africa. They were there throughout. But even prior to that, I can still remember another great African talking about leading Africa out of our state, the great South African Pixley Kaisa Kaseme in 1906 in Colombia in the United States of America say Africa must be regenerated. When all these things happened, there were leaders in Africa at that time and their mandate was cut out for them. Their mandate was to ensure that we broke the colonial chains, and we did. I remember, and many of you here, courtesy of history, will remember many Africans at that time, and if I name them, you will agree with me that they were leaders. How many of you in this assembly will not remember Marcus Garvey? and say that he was a leader. How many of you here will not remember Julius Nyerere and not say that he was a leader? How many of you will remember Kaunda, Amilka Cabral, Samora, Moises Marshall, Agostino, Nato, Namdi, Azikiweta, Bubakar, Tafawa, Balewa, Gamal, Abdel Nasser, and many others, and remember that they were leaders who did not want to occupy political space because of material aggrandizement. They denied themselves. I so very fondly remember that when Kenneth David Kaunda left office, it was said of him that the only amount of money he had in his account was the equivalent of $5,000. That is what your current politician eats for breakfast. I can remember when Julius Kambarage Nyerere left office after 24 years, the only amount of money that he had in his account was the equivalent of 8,000 United States dollars. That is what your current politician uses for a single visit to a gymnasium. There were leaders who were selfless. They understood that it was an honor and privilege. They sacrificed their lives. They saw their positions of leadership as that of leading their brethren. They did not think that they were superior to the people they led. They thought it was a privilege and that they had the honor and that because they had that honor, then they had to serve their leaders with distinction, with consistency. They were prepared to be questioned. They did not believe that they had the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom. They were leaders because they were servants. You know, I can still remember Julius Kambarage Nyerere speaking on the 6th day of March, 1997 in Accra, Ghana, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the independence of Ghana, under the subject, without unity, Africa has no future. 
Mwalimu recounts the history of Africa. He says, when we rose up against the colonialists, our agenda was cut out for us. We, the Africans, had been humiliated in our own land. Our people had been denied the opportunity to realize their potential. Our mandate was one, to expel the colonizer. We did our best. We made our mistakes. But who said we were infallible? This struggle is an intergenerational struggle. The next generation after us had the duty to pick up the baton and to run the next leg. The question is, did that generation pick up the baton? Have they run the leg well? The answer, not as well as they should have. Because we must never make the mistake of assuming that African leaders have done nothing. No, that would be too harsh. I think attempts have been made whether in Nigeria or in different parts of Africa, to liberate ourselves from the chains and sorrows of the colonial project. But remember, as Kwame once said, the colonialist never left. He is alive and well. He still wears different masks. And those masks may appear to camouflage him, but they are here. Have you ever wondered why, when the British left their colonies, they created something that they called the Commonwealth of Nations, to which Nigeria belongs? In that Commonwealth of Nations, the head is the British monarch. When the queen dies, the king becomes its head. It is headquartered in London. It is the Commonwealth of Independent and Free Nations. It is not. It is a post-colonial, neo-colonial institution which continues to massage the ego of the erstwhile colonizer as we celebrate. Through such institutions, they continue to control and to manipulate us. And many of us, particularly those of us who have had the advantage of foreign education, we never want to talk ill of bodies such as the Commonwealth. I do. And it's not only the British who did it. The French did it under Francophonie in order to control their former colonies and to make sure that they remain within their sphere of influence, they created a body which is alive and well. In the former French colonies, it's even worse. They even print their currency. The Portuguese did it. So, in as much as African leaders have been trying to ensure that we change the circumstances of our people, there have been external attempts at, at torpedoing those efforts. And Africa and African leadership must be seen in those contexts. There are those in many African countries who have allowed themselves to be acolytes of the neo-colonizers and to the detriment of the continent of Africa. So when we interrogate leadership, we must ask ourselves, how free are our leaders? How free are our politicians from external influence? But that, is that an excuse? No, it cannot be an excuse. Leaders in a multi-ethnic environment must also be different. You know, Nigeria, as Chinua rightly said, like all African countries, is an artificial entity. 
Shinwa says in his book, The Trouble, the Trouble with Nigeria, that there is nothing comparable to how the European nations were created. There is no Nigerian Chinua Achebe says in the same way as there is a Danish or a Swedish or a Norwegian. Nigerian, Nigeria is a unique state with many states. The same is true of Kenya. The same is true of Ghana. Nigeria possibly has five, over 500 nations within her. Tanzania, 136. The Democratic Republic of Congo, 306. Kenya, 42. Uganda, 56. In order to be a leader in such countries, those who have the honor and privilege must be men and women who are prepared to ensure that they weld the bonds amongst those people. As Samora Moises Marshall said, if the post-colonial African country is to succeed, the tribe must die. And the tribe must die because if the tribe does not die, then the new nation will never thrive. And I did not understand Samora Moises Marshall to say that he should stop being a Yoruba, no. I did not understand to say that uh, him to say that he should stop being a thief or to stop being an Igbo or a Usa or a Fulani. No, those are cultural mosaics which when put together make a nation's beautiful and strong. But what does, what do we do in most of Africa? We use those cultural differences to divide the people. We use those cultural differences to reinforce centrifugal forces and therefore threaten the very nation which we want to serve. I am telling all of us who are present here and many of you who are present in this assembly who are honored and respected and claim to be leaders that you have a duty to ensure that you are in front in order to serve and not to be served. But ladies and gentlemen, let us also ask ourselves about followership. You know, as a young student, and many of us who are young students, it was the culture when you are in your first year of studies that you must be a revolutionary. And a revolutionary in the style of Karl Marx. And therefore you would say, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose, but you are chains. All of us were revolutionaries. And we used to say then that the safety of the bourgeois demands that the proletariat be kept in the most profound ignorance. We were revolutionaries. Who is a leader? Is he a leader who allows meta-ignorance to reign supreme amongst the people he or she is leading? Is it the duty of a leader to ensure that he leads men and women who are enlightened? Men and women who can question what he or she is doing? I'm suggesting to us that true and sustainable leadership also requires that you have a followership that is enlightened. A followership that calls you to account. A followership that is going to make demands of you. A followership that when you say that you are going to improve the quality of their food. They do not believe that agriculture stops on that day, but they believe that agriculture must be intensified and that technology must be used. A followership which knows that when you say you are going to deliver heaven on earth, they know that that is merely an advertisement that you are incapable of delivering heaven on earth. A followership that knows that when you are promising to do things within a hundred days, which ordinarily can only be done in five years, they know that you're a liar. A followership that is capable of discerning that when you speak things, there are many variables and it is the duty of a leadership to ensure that such a leadership is indeed created. What do African leaders do? 
African leaders in many African countries have now assigned the question of education, the educating their followers to NGOs and CBOs, which are financed by the Americans, which are financed by the Europeans, which are financed by other civilizations. How do you think, how do you imagine that the people of Denmark would have the interest of Nigeria at their heart? How are you satisfied that all those civic education activities that are being undertaken in Borno, in Maiduguri, or in Abeokuta, financed by USID, are meant to be for the benefit of Nigeria? Because the last time I checked, the English used to say, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So today, when you look at most of Africa, we have a followership that is tuned from outside. It is not a followership that is tuned from inside. And you wonder why they behave the way they do. They behave the way they do because they are being tuned by other civilization. Three years ago, an old friend of mine, now gone to be with the Lord, was engaged in a conversation with me. And I was complaining about the leadership and he told me, I hear you young man. You're always complaining about leadership in Africa and other parts, but have you ever wondered about the followership? Says you are complaining about the windmill, but do you ever bother about the wind? Is it not the case that the windmill follows the wind? I'm suggesting to you that Africa will never realize our potential as long as the critical mass of our people are immersed in sorrow and want. I am suggesting to you that Africa is not going to grow as long as you who are in positions of leadership has perfect, have perfected the art of appealing to the stomachs rather than the minds of the men and women that you lead. I'm suggesting to you that Africa is not going to realize our potential as long as we continue to conduct the politics of money and money bugs, not the politics of ideas. I'm suggesting to you that Africa is never going to realize our potential as long as we are dividing our people along ethnic lines. I'm suggesting to you. I'm suggesting to you that as long as you who are in positions of honor and privilege are in the business of dividing our people on the basis of religion, Africa is not going to realize our potential. I remember in 1982, I watched a movie about Mahatma Gandhi, and I remember that great man saying in one of the scenes in the movie that he remembers one day, when somebody who was more enlightened than the other preachers came, and he said that on that day, he saw that preacher reading from the Muslim Quran on to the Christian Bible, on to the Jewish Torah, on to the Hindu Gita, and on to incantation in African religion, as if it did not matter which book was being read as long as God was being worshipped. I look forward to the day when those of you who are in positions of leadership will be able to tell our people, wherever they are in Nigeria or Africa, that it is not for us to fight for God. If I have a God for whom I have to fight for, that is not a God. The God that I worship fights for me. And if we accept that that is the nature of God that is omnipresent, omniscient, and he knows all, then we are going to unite our people. In other words, I'm saying that if we are going to have a followership that is going to change the continent of Africa, we have got to exercise the ghost of ethnicity. We have got to exercise the ghost of ignorance. 
We have got to exercise the ghost of poverty. We have got to exercise the ghost of narrow-mindedness. Fellow Africans, fellow Nigerians, it is still true that everything fails and falls on leadership. It is true that we men and women are in unique positions. Abu Bakr or Lusala, Saraki was present on this earth. Like all of us, he had his coming and his going. Today we are gathered here to remember him because as South Sudan's John Garang de Mabior once said, as you walk the journey of life, there are two baskets that you fill by your words and deeds, whether wittingly or unwittingly. The basket of good deeds and the basket of bad deeds. And that at the end of it all, when we weigh those baskets, let it be said of you that the basket of good deeds outweighs the basket of bad deeds. It would appear to me that the late Dr. Saraki's basket of good deeds far outweighs his basket of bad deeds. And that is why we can say without flinching and without equivocation that he was a colossus. That is why you call him fondly by the Monica Oloye. That is why you are gathered here on a Monday morning to pay homage to him. Now I can see Saraki upstairs through imagination. I can see him asking us who we are present here today. Oh dear Nigerians, it is 10 years since I left you. Where are the leaders? I can see Saraki asking the president of this country, how have you served, Mr. President? I can hear him ask the vice president, how have you served? I can hear him asking the senators, how have you served? I can hear him asking the members of the House of Assembly, how have you served? I can hear him asking the governors, how have you served? As to how they have served, that is not for me to say. It is for them to say. But I can also hear the great Saraki asking the Nigerians, how have you been served? Have they given you food? I can hear him ask. Have they given you fuel? I hear him ask. Have they given you electricity, I hear him ask. As to whether they have been well served, it is not for me to say, it is for them to say. In other words, the great Saraki is asking both leaders and the led, have you demanded and have you served? And the leadership that I hear him, the great Saraki asking of us, is a leadership where we are united. Not the unity of the graveyard, whose lingua franca is silence. No. It is the unity of those who are seeking to do good. Those who are seeking to do good. Those who ask with the firmness that will open the eyes of the leader without inflaming their anger. I can hear it being said. You know, as I conclude, I remember this story, a story that must be known to you, is a story about leadership, which must be contradistinguished from human leadership, is the story of a shepherd 
or the story of a poultry farmer. But I'll start with the story of a shepherd. Many of us from the north are famed for cattle keeping. And when you are driving the cattle uh, through different grazing grounds, the cattle believe that you love them so much because you protect them from the elements, because you protect them from other wild animals. But if the cattle were to know that you are the one who would end up eating them, they would treat you very differently. Invariably, they do not know, and therefore you will continue controlling them the way you do, and you will continue eating them the way you do. But it's a totally different case when you are leading human beings. They are not like cattle. You may lead them in a particular direction. You may think that you have lulled them into a false sense of security. You may think that you have deadened their minds. But always remember that one day, if you don't do that which is good and right for your fellow men, there is a day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning and history has demonstrated that it can come in the twinkling of an eye. History has demonstrated that kings have been toppled. History has demonstrated that presidents have been removed. History has demonstrated that great men have been cut down. History has demonstrated that Men can rise when they are misled. History has demonstrated that men are indeed capable of rising up. You know, I always read these words of the American Declaration of Independence because I love them. They apply to humanity. Before America became what it is, they had enlightened men. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and alienable right that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is for this reason that governments are instituted amongst men and that when those governments fail to perform, it is the duty of those people to rise up and to remove such governments.